Amen. Good job, Jaden. Thanks, sir. All right. Let's grab our Bibles. Amen. And we're going to jump right in. Let's see here. Let me get to my notes. Amen, amen. Let me guys. Grab your Bible at stand. Amen. I gotta grab the right paper. There we go. Amen. There we are. Alright, we're gonna start tonight. We've got a pl couple places I'd like to go. Second Peter chapter one, verse number thirteen. Second Peter chapter one, verse number thirteen. Second Peter one, verse number thirteen. And then we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. So just two places in Peter I want to read from tonight. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Amen? And while you turn there, I've got my joke of the week for you. Put a smile on your face. Here you go. Ready? By the time Bobby arrived to the football game on Sunday, the football game had already started. Why are you so late? asked his friend. I couldn't, I couldn't decide between going to church and going to the football game. So I tossed a coin, said Bobby. But that shouldn't have taken too long, said the friend. He says, well, I had to toss it 35 times. <laughs> You'll get that one later. Amen? All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13. Amen? 2 Peter 1, verse number 13. Amen. And if you're there, say Amen. All right, here we go. Verse number 13. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Now look at 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of Remembrance. Amen. I was reading through my Bible and uh, doing, my, uh, doing my daily Bible reading, and I came across First and Second Peter and read through them, and God just kind of pulled out those two places there. He said to stir up. Amen. And, uh, and I love that. Amen. He says, I want to stir you up. Amen. Peter was a type of preacher said, I want to stir you up a little bit. Amen. Get you stirred up for the Lord. Amen. And so I uh, want to give you a message tonight and uh, talking about stirred up. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be at the house of God. Lord, excited for the message. Excited, Lord, for the time. Uh, Lord, in your word, Holy Spirit of God, would you please give us exactly what you know that's needed tonight. Heavenly Father, Lord, as I think ahead to, uh, Lord, what you're going to do in our hearts, Lord, not just this evening, but, Lord, coming up next week in our revival, Lord, I want to, uh, each and every person, Lord, to get something from your word to help prepare themselves uh, for what's coming. Lord, may we, uh, Lord, individually, uh, Lord, pray and prepare ourselves and our family and ask you, Lord, to do a great and a mighty work as only you can do. And Lord, we just ask that you please bless tonight. Lord, thank you for those that are uh, able to be here. Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of God's people. Lord, I pray that you would just bless all that we do. Holy Spirit of God, would you meet with us and we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 2 Peter 1, go, go back to verse number 13. Let's start there again. Look, the Bible says, Yea, I think it me, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Amen. A couple things to note there. When Peter's talking about in this tabernacle, he's talking about his body. Amen. His physical body. He says, As long as I am in this tabernacle, as long as I am physically present with you, he says, I think it me. In other words, I think it necessary, I think that it is uh, 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 beneficial to you, I think it meet to you, ready, to put you in remembrance, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So notice he says, my goal as, uh, as an apostle and as a preacher of the Word of God is to use the Word of God. Peter talks often about the Word of God and the inspiration of God and those things uh, in his Word. And he says, I'm going to use that to stir you up. But look what he says also. He says, by putting you in Remembrance. Look at verse 14. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. His goal was to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. He says, that way when I'm dead and gone and you think of Peter, all you can think about is what I told you over and over and over and over and you just remember it all the time. Why? He said, because if you'll remember it, it'll stir you up. 
It'll get you stirred up to do something for the Lord. Then look at 2 Peter 3 1. He says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both. In both what? Both epistles. Both that he wrote. He says, In both, which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful. Ready? Of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Ready what that is? The Bible. He says, I want to stir you up. I want to put you in, in remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the holy prophets. That's the Old Testament. And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. That's the New Testament. He says, I'm going to use the Bible. I'm going to use the Old and New Testament to remind you, to keep in you remembrance that you would be mindful of those words because those words will stir you up. Those words are the words that will stir your pure minds. Boy, what a blessing. Look at verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And Peter goes down through a list of things there. But he's saying, There's going to come last days, those that scoff and those that mock, and they're going to try to discourage you. They're going to try to get you to quit what you're doing for God. They're going to try to get you to quit loving on the Lord and quit going to church and quit reading your Bible and get you just to doubt God and that God's not keeping His promises. He says, but let me help you. How I'm going to stir you up is I'm just going to keep you mindful of the Word of God. Because if we'll stay, uh, keep our hearts and minds on God's Word, God's Word will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, and it will keep us stirred up to get into this wicked old world. Say, so what do we in the world do you have a revival for? What in the world do you have church for? You ready? All church is for is to make you mindful of the things of the Word of God that will help stir you up to get you through the next day. To get you through the next part of your life. And I want you to see, God, and I walked through the Bible and I saw different places in the Bible where God stirred people. And what God stirred people for, the word stir means to wake up. The word stir means to arouse from sleep. Amen. The word stir there, amen, just means to wake somebody up. Amen. Boy, as Christians, we fall asleep fast, don't we? We get asleep fast spiritually. Amen. We also fall asleep fast physically. Amen. And, uh, and that's what, uh, the preaching, that's why preaching's got to be loud. Amen. It stirs you up. And, uh, oh, yeah, he's preaching. And uh, we stir up the things of God. Why? Because uh, we, fi we fast fall asleep to the things of God and we fall asleep to what God wants us to do. And so the preaching of the Word of God wakes us back up. Hello. Boy, I love preaching. Amen. I love old-fashioned preaching. I love hard-nosed preaching. I love rough sandpaper preaching. Amen. Where it just grinds the Christian and it just puts that polished edge. Amen. You ever done woodwork? Boy, I love woodwork. I really do. That's a, that's a hobby of mine. I love it. I'm not very good at it. Don't ask me to make you anything because it probably would fall apart. But so far, I made my wife a coffee table and it ain't broke yet. Amen. And, uh, and I love that stuff. But you know, the greatest thing about woodwork is that, you know, there's a lot of lessons. And I learn a little bit, you know, with woodwork, when you're sanding down, you've got to get something that's coarse, something that's got some grit to it, and rub that wood down to get it to where it's smooth. But it takes some sandpaper to get it down and to rub across that, get something with some grit, so you can get something accomplished. If you ever tried to take silk and rub it across wood to see if it'll do anything... It doesn't do a whole lot. In fact, you probably get more splinters than you will anything else. But when you get something with some grit to it, you start rubbing it across that piece of wood. It starts molding that and it starts finishing that to something that you can use. And you know, the Word of God is the same way. And good old-fashioned hard-nosed preaching is like that sandpaper. It's, a little, it's got some grit to it, and it's got some bite to it, and it kind of scrapes us up a little bit, and it kind of rounds off those edges, and it just kind of, boy, when it goes over our spiritual, uh, our spiritual soul, it's, whoa, amen, that's hard stuff, but it makes you usable for God. This new preaching out there, amen, is like rubbing silk on wood. Yeah. It does nothing. In fact, it ruins more of the silk than it does anything else. But God wants you to have preaching that puts you in mindful of His Word, that stirs you up. Boy, and I look through the, the Word of God at different times that God stirred up His people. Hey, I don't know about you, but I want God to keep me stirred. 
I want God to keep me awake to the things of God. I don't want to fall asleep as a Christian. I don't want to get mundane as a Christian. I don't want to get as a Christian or as a church to a place where we forget what God wants us to do. I don't want to get to the place as a church where we get asleep to what we're supposed to be doing for God and we get asleep to winning souls and asleep to people to where when somebody gets baptized, that just it doesn't mean a whole lot. I don't want to get to the place where we get asleep, where when somebody comes forward and gets saved at an old-fashioned altar and trusts Christ as their Savior, that we don't get excited about that and realize what just happened at an old-fashioned altar. I've seen people get up and say, hey, so-and-so just trusted Christ. Let me say that again. So-and-so just trusted Jesus as their Savior. They're not going to hell! And all of a sudden, oh, yeah, yeah. But you say anything about football. Oh, yeah! Got it! Yeah! But you say, boy, this person just got saved. Trust Jesus as a Savior. They did what? Oh, got saved. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. Boy, somebody gets baptized and they walk down and boy, we, uh, you know, and that's great. Boy, we're not, we don't realize how, what a big step in somebody's life that that is, that they're taking those steps of growth and we're not as excited. You know why? Because we're asleep. We get where we get asleep, and we for, I get this way too. I've got to stir myself up daily to remind myself, stay on task. Stay on target, because the devil is a good lullaby singer. The devil gets us to sleep as Christians and rocks us to the tune of the world to where we forget about the things of God. Falling asleep to the tune of the devil. So it's so important to stay away from the things of the world. Get inside the Word of God and let God stir you up. Let God keep you awake so you can do something for God. I want you to see a couple things and we'll be done. Just a couple things uh, that God stirred up people throughout the Bible. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Go back to the book of Exodus. Look at verse number 35. Exodus, verse number 35. God stirred these people up. All the way back in the book of Exodus. Look, Exodus 35, verse number 21. And they came everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. What happened here in the book of Exodus was God gave Moses the plan, what he wanted to do with the tabernacle, what he wanted to have built, what he needed, and he said, I want you to take what I have given to you, and I want you to take and show it to the people, and let the people get a burden to meet the need. And so Moses comes to the people and says, okay, God wants us to build for him a tabernacle. And he shows God wants us to do it this way. And God wants us to use this material. And then God wants the priest to have a certain garment. And then he wants it to be of this material. He wants it to be sewn this way. And then he wants us to make the, 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 the table with the 12 different stones for every tribe of Israel. And God wants it this way. He says, so I'm going to need somebody that can build. And I'm going to need somebody that can sew. I'm going to need somebody to go out and get the material. And I'm going to need an engraver. And, I'm gonna need, and Moses just went and said, this is what God wants us to do. Now I need somebody to fill it. And so the Bible says, ready? Then they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up. So not everybody came. But the people whose hearts were stirred to meet the need. And those people that let God stir them. And look what he says. And, e and everyone whom his spirit made willing... Notice that what all Moses did was go to the people and say, here's the need. Here's what needs to happen. And he stepped back and let God do the rest. And God put upon the hearts of people whom he gave talents to. And God began to stir them. And so their hearts stirred them and they were willing in spirit. You know, there's a lot of times where God's trying to stir the hearts of Christians, but we're not willing to let God do it. And so we don't do what God wants us to do because we're not willing. They made the Spirit willing. Look what it says. It says, And everyone whom His Spirit made willing, they had to decide, I am willing to give my time and talents for the Lord. They, they said, Hey, I'll do it. Moses said, All right, I need somebody over here to, to build a tabernacle. I'll do it. All right, I need somebody over here to, to, to sew. I need some ladies that know how to sew these garments. And I'll do it. And I need somebody that can engrave. And anybody got to tell, I'll do it. And their heart stirred them up. And they said, I'll be willing to do it for God. It's for the Lord. I'll do it. And look what happened. 
And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and jewels of gold. And that, that's not tablets as in like, you know, iPods, iPhones, anything like that. That's, that's okay, you've got to get your mind out of the 21st century. Man. And jewels of gold. And every man that offered, that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and found linen and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man who with whom was found shit him wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair and the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses Boy, can you see this revival. Boy, can you see Moses is excited. He said, man, God's given me. He wants us to do this. And can you see him kind of nervous? Oh, I don't know, God, how these people are going to take it. I don't know, God, if they're going to go for this. Amen. This is a big job. This is a big task, God. You sure? And God says, yes, I want you to go to the people. I want you to tell them this is what I want to build, and I want you to do it, and I'm going to work, work, work the rest, but you tell them this is what I want. You sure, God, it's a big order. Maybe we can swing, shrink it down a little bit, make it a little smaller, make this feasible. We did just come out of Egypt. and No, this is what I want done. Okay, God, Moses goes and says, all right, this is what I think God wants us to do. Can you see him step back? and wait for somebody to start throwing stones. Crazy man! He's kind of... And you know, I can sympathize with Moses. You know, the man of God says, okay, I, I think this is what God wants us to do. And you wait to see the reaction of the people. Can you see Moses as all the people? Let's do it! You're sure? <laughs> You don't mind. I mean, this is going to be late nights, and it's going to be hard work, and it's going to mean money, and this is going to mean uh, 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 money, and uh, this is going to mean uh, money, and, and you're sure about this. Amen? Can you see the man of God? Amen? This is going to mean uh, more money. Let's do it. And boy, Moses excited, but God did the work, and God stirred the heart of the people to meet the needs. Hey, listen to me. I want God to stir up my heart that when God needs something at His church, that God knows that I'm willing to meet the need. Hey God, I'll do something. Hey God, I'll take care of this. Hey God, I'm willing. Amen. I remember uh, as a young teenager, amen, I'd go, I'd go to hear preaching and they'd say, boy, God needs somebody. And I'd just say, I'm willing. I'm scared to death, but I'm willing. Amen. Don't send me to Africa amen, where I'm going to die, but I'm willing. And I remember, I remember going through Wichita going, boy, this place needs a church. <laughs> this was when I was a teenager. I remember driving through and going, boy, this place needs a church. I just remember telling Dad, boy, Dad, this, Wichita needs a church. Then I remember as a teenager, and then I got a call from here saying, you want to go? No. I met somebody else. <laughs> you know, that's how God works. God lets you see a need, so you'll fill it. You realize that God gives you a talent, or God gives you the abilities to supply a need, that He has for you to fill that. But it's only for those that have that willing heart. That what happens is through the Word of God and through the preaching of God, that you let God stir up your heart and you say, you know what, God is stirring me to do something about this. God, I'm willing if you'll open the door. Boy, can you see, as Moses said, all right, I need somebody to take care of this, and I need somebody to take care of this, and I need somebody to do this, and boy, these people just, their hearts were stirred, said, we just want to do anything for God. And if God will let us do it, we're willing. Boy, God stirred them up to meet the needs. Hey, listen, what need has God stirred up? Maybe it's a need of a church. Maybe, it's a, maybe there's a need for uh, whatever that it may be. Well, a need for a bus ministry, a need for a, a, a Sunday school, a need for whatever that it may be. God will stir up your heart and you'll know between you and God that God is doing something and you've got to decide whether or not you're going to be willing just to do anything for God. And boy, these people meant the need. What a blessing it was. Number two, we've got to hurry.
Number two, show you elsewhere God met some needs. Look at, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse number 16. Where else God, excuse me, stirred up people. Acts chapter 17, verse number 16. Listen, are you awake tonight? Say amen. Are you stirred? Amen. Are you stirred up? You're awake? Look at what else God did. Listen to me. Let's be the type of church that we want God to stir us. Listen to me. God will stir if you'll let Him. God will put His hand in the pot and turn the pot and wake you up if you'll let Him. But you've got to let Him. Look at Acts 17, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Say, other some, to he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. The second thing I find that God stirred people up is God stirred people up for souls. You see, as Paul was standing there, he's waiting for Timothy and waiting for some other men to come to him at Athens, and he's standing there waiting. And all Paul is doing, the Bible says, is standing. He's just standing there. He's not doing anything. He's not out giving the gospel. He's, not doing, he's standing waiting. And the Bible says he looks and sees all these people. And he sees them given to idolatry. He sees that they're going after a false god. He sees that they're going to die and burn in hell because of the idolatry that they're in. And the Bible says the more that he saw it, it just began to stir his spirit. It just began to do something on the inside of Paul to where he said, somebody's got to do something. These people are lost. These people are going to die and go to hell. Somebody's got to do something. And so Paul, the Bible says that he begins to go to the market and he goes to the synagogue and he goes to the devout persons and everywhere, anytime, daily, he goes and preaches Jesus. Well, you know, that's what we ought to be as Christians. It ought to be something on the inside of you that when you're just standing there in places or you're just waiting somewhere or you're just taking some time that you look around and you see people and God just starts stirring your heart. And you just start looking at people that are dying and going to hell. And you just start seeing them given to idolatry or seeing them trust in their works. And just start letting God stir your spirit. Start waking you up to the fact these people are lost. That's what happened to Paul. He's standing there at Athens and all he's doing is looking around. And God begins to work on his heart and say, You realize, Paul, they're lost? You're standing here waiting, doing nothing. Paul the Apostle, standing there, doing nothing. And you see God stirring his heart saying, You're just standing here. And Paul begins to let God stir him up and realize, I'm waiting, but while I'm waiting, I can preach the gospel. Well, how many times do you find yourself standing doing nothing? I remember when my wife was in, you know, this is what God does for me. I don't know how God does it for you, but this is what God does for me. My wife was in Walmart, amen? And uh, I don't go in Walmart. It's of the devil. I hate Walmart, amen? And uh, so I let my wife go shop. I just stay in the van, amen? So I'm waiting in the van. She's in Walmart, and I'm just sitting there just watching people go by. And I'm watching people, and then I see this guy right in the truck next to me, and he starts loading in his stuff. And God begins to say, well, you're just doing nothing. So, I worked hard. I deserve a break. This is how me and God yeah, talk. I don't know about you, but, you know, and he says, well, give him a track. Well, I don't have any tracks. And I looked down the cup holder, and I had just put these tracks there this morning. <laughs> like, thanks. So I grab a track and look at it. And I say, well, Lord, he's getting ready to leave. Because I thought he got off his truck, he's getting in the car, getting in the truck. It was a beautiful truck, too, Chevy Silverado. He's getting, I was like, Lord, he's getting ready to leave. And, God, and I look up, and all he was doing was taking his basket over. So he's, God says, see, you still got time. So I'm this, like, okay, okay, okay. God says, you're going to let him die and go to hell? Okay, okay. And I turn the key off, and I close the door, and I get out, I walk over. Hey, he's already in the truck. He's looking at me. <laughs> what are you doing? Hey, man? I said, hey, man. I said, I, you know, God put on my heart. I want to just come invite you to church. Took some time to give him the gospel. And he's not from around here and kind of wasn't sure about salvation and, and didn't have some time to talk there. And I tried to give him the gospel, but he didn't get saved. But I just remember walking away going, all right, Lord, I'm sorry. 
But you know, how many times do you find yourself waiting and you're not doing anything? Look up. One of the biggest problems for Christians is this. I think I know why God said, look. Because He knew we would have a problem. He knew we would look everywhere else except people. And God says if you'll get your eyes off of what's not important, and while you're standing waiting, then you'll find that when you see people, and you see that they're lost, and you see the condition that you're in, that God will begin to stir who you are. Hey, you find yourself waiting at Walmart? Look around. I remember one time my wife's out shopping. It was, we, I went with her to Walmart. God forbid. I went with her. But I was standing there and another guy's wife was standing there shopping. So I started talking with him. Hey, wife here? Yeah. Having fun? No, me neither. <laughs> you want to go home? Yeah, me too. And I started talking to him and I gave him, I gave him a track, invited him to church, gave him the gospel. You know, you, you find yourself in places that, listen, God's going to put you in places where He wants you to be because He wants you to look so He can stir your heart to get the gospel. God did not have Paul stay in Athens, but God had Paul reach people in Athens at that time. And listen to me, God wants to stir your heart for souls, but God has a hard time stirring your heart when you won't take time to see the people. Listen to me, let's be the type of Christian where we carry tracks everywhere we go. Carry tracks every hour of the day. Carry tracks everywhere you go, everywhere you go, and when you find yourself waiting, take some time and find somebody else that maybe God has there at that same time and get them the gospel. Maybe all you can do is leave a track with them and they'll read it later and get saved. But you don't know what God wants you to do till you take time to look up and let God wake you up. We're asleep. We're asleep. Boy, we're having fun with the game, but we're asleep to souls dying and going to hell all around us. God says, look and let me stir you up. And Paul began to wake up while he's just waiting in Athens. He's just waiting there. And God begins to wake him up and say, hello, do something. I think sometimes God just gets frustrated. God puts us in places and we're just waiting there. And I can see God sometimes just want to come down and just say, hello, do something. Move! Grab a track! Guy walks by. Hey, how's it going? Hey, doing great. I need help. I need an illustration. I need help. Cyrus, come on. Come on, Cyrus. Come on. Asa, come on. Come on. You be the other guy. Come on. Come on. And Asa. We'll, we'll, let, we'll let all of them. Asa, Asa, and Cyrus. Amen. Okay. All right. You two guys, you're the lost worldly people. Okay? We'll make you guys the lost people. Cyrus, we're going to make you the soul winner. Okay? We're going to make you the Christian. Amen? All right. I want you guys just to walk by. Walk by and say hi to him. Hi. And you guys say hi back. Hi. You got to be nice. You can't be, you, can't be, you can't be a rude Christian. Okay? We can't be a rude Christian. You got to be a nice Christian. Okay? We got to be kind people. Amen? Kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, I've forgiven you. Ad Adeline quoted me that verse this morning. Amen? And uh, uh, this, I, I, can you see God? Come back over here. Okay? You guys walk back by. You guys walk back, back. Come over here. We gotta have room. All right, walk. Can you see God? Hello. You have tracks? I don't have tracks on me either. <laughs> Hello. And then people just walk by. Now go walk off the pole. Go back to your seat. Go walk down and go back to your seat. Can you see, God? I set all that up for you. I put you right here at this spot, and I had those people come by. They were ready. I've been working on them for two weeks. I put them right by you, and what'd you do? Nothing. You see how frustrated I think God gets at us sometimes? Because that's how God. Now, this is how God speaks to me. Okay, I don't know how God does it for you, but God just rips me apart. You are a lazy bum preacher. 
Yes, God. I'm sorry, God. I'll go back, God. They're gone. Well, maybe they'll come back, God. No. They just went by. They might die tomorrow. This is how God does for me. And God just rips my heart apart and says, because you were too busy, you didn't let me stir you up. How many times, dear Christian, have you found yourself waiting at the doctor's office? And you're just too busy looking at the magazine you shouldn't look at anyway. Oop, didn't mean to touch that one. Go ahead, go to see. Should be looking at the woman's magazine anyway. And you're just sitting there looking through, and instead of looking up and saying, hey, what are you here for? Well, can I, can I invite you to church and give you the gospel? How many times has God, boy, just ripped my heart out about? Sometimes I've missed that opportunity. Let God stir you up for souls. Let God wake you up to the fact that people are lost. People are given to idolatry and they're going to die and go to hell. And, it, and Paul was the type of person that when, it, when, when God began to stir him, that he couldn't, do, he couldn't help it. He just started, find, he found a place and he just got up and just started preaching. Hey! You're going to hell! Buddha's not God! Just started preaching Jesus. Remember one time my dad and I, we were on our way home from church. I'll never forget it. Amen. Dad's crazy. Amen. That's where I get it from. And uh, we're on our way home from church. And there's all, all these people downtown Hutchinson. I mean, and, I mean, and, and, and just and all these people out everywhere. We just couldn't believe all these people. And, and they're just out. They're out at the bar. They're out at this place. At this, and just people everywhere. And I remember we're driving home. And I'm just sitting there having a good time, whistling to the, the songs that Dad had. And all of a sudden, Dad just hits the brake. And turns. I'm just like flying everywhere. I was like, what are you doing? Get out, son. I said, Dad, it is 11 o'clock at night. This is not the place to be getting out in downtown Hutchinson at 11 o'clock at night. He's like, get out, son. Come on. So me and Dad got out. Shirt and ties and Bibles. And I'll never forget standing there. And Dad gets on the corner and just starts preaching. I mean, just starts belly whooping, calling them what it is, saying, you bunch of alcoholics and you bunch of drunkards, you're out here partying, you should have been at church, and Jesus died to save your soul, and you're out here and you don't give a lick, and you're going to die and burn in hell over the blood of Jesus, but there's a way to heaven. I mean, he just starts going, I'm like, well, this is good stuff. <laughs> Woo! And then he's like, come on, son, let's sing. We sing, uh, we sing a couple of hymns, and he got back up and just yelled. And he says, your turn. I said, all right. So I get out there, and I start preaching. I don't even know what I preach, amen. I just preach against everything in the book, amen. And uh, then all of a sudden, the police guy drives by. <laughs> it's like 12 o'clock at night. He's driving by. So he pulls around, and I'm watching. I'm like, uh, dad, 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 <laughs> dad, 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 <laughs> dad, <laughs> dad. <laughs> He's like, what? I was like, Look. and so the police guy's walking up. What are you doing? Dad's like, well, I'm Pastor Haley. I'm out here preaching the gospel. He says, I was driving by, saw all these people, and I just couldn't help. I got to get out of here and preach Jesus. And so, the, and so the police officer's like, oh, cool. I'll just sit here and protect you. If you got any problems, let me know. He walked back in the car, rolled his window down. He sat there for about 30 minutes. Just listen. He put his thumbs up. And we preached for another 30 minutes. Amen. Just had a great time. And I just never forget. Boy, Dad, just looking at the people, just stirred up to a point. We just had to get out and preach. And so then we started Thursday night street preaching. And so we started preaching on different corners, and we were seeing people saved, and we would carry two flags, and we'd have the Bible, and we'd sing songs, and we'd have all these people. Oh, it was amazing. But somebody let God stir them up. Listen to me. If we can get stirred up for football, and we can get stirred up for sports, then we can get stirred up for Jesus once in a while. Get stirred up to the point to where we've got to take action. We've got to hurry and we'll be done. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 6. Paul talking to young Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Look at what God talks about before, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. God told Timothy, I want you to stir up that gift of God, stir up that faith. It's in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. and Stir up 
on the inside. Put yourself in remembrance of the things of God and what God has done for you and the heritage that God has given to you and let that stir you up to put your faith in God. He said, listen to me. God's called you to preach. God's called you, Timothy, to do something for you, to do something for Him. Stir it up. Listen to me. Has God called you to do something for Him? I don't know what it is. Maybe God's called you to preach. Maybe God's called you to be a missionary and you've not told anybody. Maybe God's called you to go start a church and you haven't told anybody. Maybe God's just called you to work on a bus or maybe to go reach people. Maybe God's called you to do something. Whatever that it is, God may have called you to do something and God has given you a gift and God wants you to get stirred up to use it. Too many people, God calls and asks them to do something, but they're so busy for themselves, they never do it for God. And they do it for themselves, and they live for themselves. But Paul tells Timothy, a young man, he says, Listen, Timothy, God wants you to do something for Him. Don't ever d underestimate that. Don't ever go and serve something else and have a different career. If God asked you to do something for Him, you do it with all your heart, and you serve God and never let anything take the place of that, and you let God be first in your life. But so often what happens is young people and even old people, we get to where our life takes precedence and our agenda and God can't use us and God's trying to stir up the gift that He's given to us so He can use us to reach people, but we're just so consumed. We've got our schedule planned out. And how dare God mess with my schedule? How dare there be a revival on Monday night? I've got to go to the ballpark. Wichita wingnuts are playing. I remember laughing at that the first time I saw that. Wingnuts? Wichita's got to do something better than wingnuts. Amen? And, uh, but, well, I mean, you know, there's so many people. Revival on Monday night? I've got bowling. Well, whoop de doo you go take that bowling ball that's just as hard as your head and go roll it down the aisle and bowl pins. In fact, roll yourself down with it because better you do that instead of just somehow we think better I do that than be in church. And boy, we've got, we, we've got everything else planned on our schedule except God. And I'm not going to be there. But I'm not going to be showing up because I've got my schedule planned. And boy, if that just gets in the way, boy, I just can't let God stir me up. Listen to me. Let God take precedence. Now, things happen and things come up. I get that. I'm not saying that, you know, that you know, sometimes emergencies or things that, you know, that have to be taken care of. But so often what happens is peddly things. And our Christian life take precedence over God and God wants to stir up the gift that He's given to us so that way He can use us, but God can't because we're too busy using our gift for ourselves, Using the talent for what we want it for. Using our talents for ourselves. Hey, can I ask you, you know, God, uh, Paul told Timothy, and we're going to do this and, and I'll be just done. I'll, I'll be, I'll finish. Paul told Timothy, he said, hey, Timothy, God's called you to preach. Timothy, no doubt, maybe had some goals for his life. And Timothy went and pastored a church. Tim then Timothy had a whole, his whole life ahead of him, but did what God wanted him to do and went where God wanted him to go to use the gift that God had given to him to preach. Can I ask you something? What gift has God given to you and where does God want you to go? I'm not asking where you want to go with your life. Where does God want you to go? Listen to me. God's given you a gift to use for Him. Listen to me. God's given you a gift to use for Him. How dare we plan to use the gift for ourselves instead of asking God, say, God, where do you want me to use my gift? Do you realize that God has planned out your life from birth to retirement? Ready? When you were born, it wasn't an uh-oh with God. And when you die, it's not going to be, oops, forgot they were alive. God has your life plan, birth to retirement. And in between then, God's given you a gift that He wants you to use for Him to reach people. But what happens is we get about so far in our life, and then we plan the rest of our life whether or not God wants us to go. Well, God, where do you want me to retire? Hey, God, where do you want me to go to reach people? Hey, God, where do you want me to be? Are you ready? I have a hard time believing. Ready for this? I have a hard time believing when I've heard Christians 
God wants me to retire, and they'll name some place out in the middle of nowhere. No church, nobody to give the gospel to, in the middle of like nowhere. And this is that meteor stuff of the world of God that I was talking about this morning. Do you realize that God is not going to ask you to go somewhere where you can't go to church? Think about it. God's given you a gift, and that gift is to serve Him with. So somehow you're going to get moved up into the Rocky Mountains and be the mountain man. I heard that. I'm going to go get a lodge up in the mountains, and you'll never find me again. Now, if there weren't people to win, I would go. Like, if I didn't have to you know, win souls, and boy, if this was just a perfect world, I'd be in the Rocky Mountains fishing in the lake. Whoopsh. But God has a will, and God has people He wants me to reach, and God says this world is going to pass away. Heaven's eternity, that's what matters. So why don't you just stay in my will all the way through your cotton-picking life and win people to Jesus? Why would we make our plan when God says, I've got a gift given to you to reach people. God has done something amazing inside of you. God's given you salvation. God's put His Holy Spirit. God has given you everything you need to reach others for eternity. But then we're going to go and make our own plans. Where we want to go, what we want to do, and we have our bucket list... And I'm not against bucket lists. I've got mine. But let's let God have priority. God, where do you want me for the rest of my life? Where do you want me to live the rest of my... Where do you want me to retire? Where do you want me to go and help a church and win people to Jesus and go soul winning and win the lost? Where do, what do you want for me, God? Boy, God wants to stir us up. Last thing in... We're done. Isaiah 64, 7, last verse. I won't give the other point. We'll give you this verse. We'll be done. You ready? Isaiah 64, 7. But the problem that we have, and there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou art and thou our potter, and we all are the work of Thy hand. Isaiah said the problem is, God, that nobody wants to be stirred. Truly the problem that we have as Christians is we don't want to be awake. We don't want God to stir us for souls. We don't want God to stir us up and use us. We want to stay asleep. And there is none that calleth on thy name, and there is none that stirreth up himself. Boy, we're, we're stirred for everything else we want to be stirred for. Listen to me. But Isaiah said, but God, there's nobody that stirs themselves up for you. And he says, but Lord, you're the potter. We're the clay. Listen to me, if for no other reason you let God stir you up, would you let God stir you up because of how much He cares for you and how much that He's done for you as the potter? You realize, let's just get back down to brass tacks, we're clay. We're dust. Who are we to think that we're something so great that we can tell God what to do with the clay? Isaiah, I think believe it's Isaiah and Ezekiel, he says, what is the tool doing telling the master what to do? It's the master that tells the tool. The hammer doesn't tell me what to do with it. I pick up the hammer and use it wherever I need. And the clay doesn't tell the potter what to do or, where, or what to make. The clay just lets the potter mold and make into what the potter wants. And stirring up is just being like clay in the potter's hand. It's just letting God make you into who God wants you to be and let you be where God wants you to be. Say, God, whatever you want, you're the potter. I'm just the clay. God, I give my life to you. If you want me to do this, or if you want me to be this, or if you want to use me for this, or if you want to use me for that, if you want to make me a beautiful vessel, 
or if you just want to make me a cup, I'll do whatever that you want. Listen, my goal that I want God for me is I just want to be clay to where God just does whatever that He wants. Say, God, just, just whatever. Because this life means nothing. What you have in this life means nothing. What you get in this life means nothing. All the lands that you can have and all the wealth that you means nothing. But what God does for you means everything. And what God does with you. When you get to heaven and God, the potter looks at you and says, Well, I'm so glad you let me mold you. But then there's some clay that God has to set aside because they're so hard. God can never stir them up. Boy, they just had their own dreams and own goals. But God could never get them to be what He wanted them to be. I don't want to be that. I want God to be able to stir me up. I want to be that clay in the potter's hand. Hey, young person, would you let God make you to what He wants you to be? You've got your dreams and your goals, and that's great. I'm all about goals. But let God give you the goals. Let God say, this is what I want. This is my goal for you. Hey, Mom and Dad, let God do that for your kids. We've got dreams and goals for our children, and that's great, but let God have your kids. Say, God, you make them whatever you want them to be. If you want them to preach, let them preach. You want them to be a missionary, let them be a missionary. You want them to be a, bu you want them to be a businessman. God, whatever you want, you mold them. God, you make my family whatever that you want to be. And listen to me. There's nothing greater, and we're done. But if you get nothing else from the message, and if you were asleep, and I couldn't get you stirred up, get one thing. There'll be nothing greater than knowing that you let the potter have his way. You get to the end of your life, you'll be miserable knowing, I didn't let the potter mold the clay. But there's nothing better when the finished product comes out of that oven and the potter looks at the clay and says, well done. Well done. You did good. And I'm looking for a well done. I may, God may have to say you were the dumbest child I ever had. But well done. You obeyed. You let me mold you. You let me make you. Would you give in to God? Or do you have your dreams? You have your goals. He's the potter. Let him make the clay. Because if you let the potter make the clay, he kind of takes that rough edges out. You know why some people are kind of grouchy? Yeah, Christians that just kind of get grouchy. You know why? It's because when clay gets hard and lumpy, it's not really satisfied for what it is. But when you let the potter mold you and smooth you out and take off those rough edges, everybody goes, boy, that, that's something special. Hey, let, let the potter mold the clay. Let God stir you up, whatever that God wants. Biggest thing you can stir up, stir up for souls. Nothing else stirs you up. Look at the lost. Look at your family. Look at your friends. Look at this world. When you drive home, watch the people that walk by and think about their eternity. And it might just be that God stir you up to pull over and hand them a gospel tract. And it might just be that God stir you up to pull over and give them the gospel and you find people get saved even on the way home. But you'll never know until you let God stir you. Do you want God to stir you? I know I do. Let's let God do that. Lord, we love you. Lord, I pray and beg you, please, that we would be a church that lets you stir our hearts. God, I want to be a pastor that is stirred. I want to be a pastor, Lord, that is stirred up and awake to the things of God. Lord, I want to be the type of preacher that, Lord, when you stir my heart, that I listen and that I'm willing to do whatever that you want me to do. Lord, help us as a church. That God, you'd give us that kind of spirit. Or Lord, when there's a need that you want filled, that we would make ourselves willing and let you stir us up to meet that need. Lord, when there's souls that you want reached, that Lord, we would get stirred up to get the gospel to those people. And Lord, that we would not be a church that is asleep, that a church that Lord is...